one day, I saw a seven-year-old patient. Her name is Sarah. Sarah has been a patient of mine for about a year and a half ago. She has started wearing glasses since she was four years old. After an annual checkup, when Sarah was about to leave the office with her mom that day, she kind of whispered next to her mom's ear, and I don't know what she was saying. At first, I thought, oh, I was in trouble. But later, her mom later found out that Sarah was actually a little bit shy to tell me in person. She actually wanted to thank me for being her eye doctor, since she felt I'm just a little bit different from other eye doctors that she has seen, for a specific reason, an interest, in, interesting reason too, because she thought that I don't give her glasses for seeing. Isn't it weird? What she has been ecstatic about is to have a cool thing that she wear at nighttime so that she can help her see clearly during the daytime. Meanwhile, her vision, for the very first time, has shown to be remarkably stable without worsening. Her mom has been so thankful for seeing her daughter being so comfortable and confident and also being socially independent in school. As an optometrist who works exclusively with children, my goal and mission is to help children achieve the best possible potential vision every day. What is seemingly typical workday for me can actually render a pivotal transformation for young patients like Sarah. Just like a give exchange, this process is mutual. Sarah has taught me that the real gift of seeing is to see things with big and wild dreams. In fact, no dream is too small or too crazy, especially when we're young. So for Sarah, her, her dream is to become a professional soccer goalie one day. What is the world that we're seeing that we don't see but children are seeing? Well, it's always been amusing to see that children's creativity has been so uniquely different or somewhat even surreal compared to adults. For, for instance, they would see that the eyeball looked like a universe to them, or they would describe their eyeglasses as a unicorn because they make them feel unique and special. Picture after pictures. These young kids do teach me and inspire me that seeing is not the same as envisioning. To me, children's vision reflects the beauty of seeing the present and also envisioning the future. Like all parents in the world, I'm sure parents will do whatever they can to give their children the best possible potential in life. Vision is of no exception. If the ability of seeing is like driving a vehicle with the headlights on, then envisioning will likely enhance your vehicle to an Aston Martin shown in the 007 movies. How can you achieve that? Is it just about that they're able to see the vision chart in school or being able to pass the vision screening test? What can we do to ensure that the health of the vision today can still be maintained in the same top-notch level a decade later? Well, let us look into what vision is meant to us biologically and functionally. In essence, human has been instinctively sight dominant. In fact, we perceive almost 80% of all impressions by means of vision. In context of neurophysiology, scientists have found that nearly 30 to 40% of our cerebral cortex in our brain is specifically devoted to vision or visual processing pathways, as compared to 8% for tactile sense or merely 3% for hearing auditory sense. As much as our ability to see seems to be so intuitive and effortless at first glance, vision indeed is far more sophisticated and complex than we ever imagined. Whenever we see something, we do not really see with our eyes first, but with our brains. Studies have found that the process of seeing actually involves more than 30 specific regions in our brains, notably the lateral geniculate nucleus, which acts as a relay center in the thalamus for visual processing before neurochemical signals are being converted into a physical object that we see within a tiny fraction of a second. So it's truly amazing and wondrous to see how we see what we see at this moment and in everyday life. As you can now appreciate the complexity of vision, just imagine that the psychological dilemma of losing this vital sense can really drive people towards self-doubt, fear, and chaos. If the idea of losing this uh, vital sense seems to be too distant or irrelevant to you, I hope you can think twice. Please just look around you and see how many of your families and friends are actually wearing glasses right now. As simple as waking up in the morning and be naturally able to see the alarm clock clearly is truly a blessing. So congratulations for those who can.
Your, your vision by nature is already far better than one third of the population on the planet. Today, I want to share with you that myopia, or known as nearsightedness, has become one of the most common yet also overlooked global eye care dilemma in children. Although conventional glasses and contact lenses help keep vision clear temporarily, they have not yet shown much success in treating the roots of myopia in children. In other words, their myopic condition have continued and will continue to get worse over time. We used to think or say that this is just the way it is, or there's little we can do about it. Why bother? But the good news is we're rightfully marching into an exciting phase of providing long-term stability for myopia and for children, notably with custom corneal reshaping and multifocal contact lens technique, as well as a topical pharmaceutical approach. All these interventions are currently being used as off-label applications with great success in transforming young eyes and their quality of lives. So, do we not know enough about myopia yet? Let us take a look. Here, what we're seeing at the bottom diagram is a typical eye with normal, healthy development. The one at the top diagram represents the atypical eye with myopia development. From an optical perspective, myopia occurs when light can no longer be focused precisely at the right focal spot. Instead, it falls in front of the retina, known as the sensor of the eye. This is how objects become blurry at distance without correction. But why are light out of focus in the first place? Well, it is when the eye outgrows a normal trajectory and they become elongated in length and in size. As shown in the top diagram, one of the most quick fix known in history is to get a new pair of conventional glasses and contact lenses simply to make the vision clear temporarily. However, what most people may not realize is that under the influence of negative or minus single vision prescription lenses, especially among children, their eyes are particularly vulnerable and they're made to stretch longer and longer. As a result, it is believed to be the so-called byproduct of the conventional way of correcting myopia. The prescription continued to get worse and worse over time in order to compensate the elongation of the eyes, which unfortunately further exacerbate the progression of myopia in a vicious cycle. The next thing that could happen is if, without proper intervention to arrest further elongation, the retinal tissue will likely become thinner and thinner and also more fragile. This is associated with increased risk of vision-threatening complications, such as myopic maculopathy, retinal detachment, as well as glaucoma. In fact, myo myopic maculopathy has emerged as a leading cause of blindness in Asia and worldwide. What would it be like when children struggle with this learning and daily activities simply because of this growing yet preventable vision dilemma? In the United States alone, the prevalence of juvenile myopia has increased from 25% in 1972 to 44% in 2004. Essentially, every two out of five children in the U.S. have already become nearsighted. To put it into perspective, the impact of myopia to the fat children has nearly as common as juvenile obesity. In 2016, according to the National Health and Nutritional Examination Survey, it was found that one out of five children have already become obese. Isn't it scary? As if it's not worse enough, the global prevalence of myopia has surged by 66% in the past three decades. It's estimated that nearly half of the global population, which is about five billion people worldwide, will become nearsighted by the year 2050. To call myopia a disease is probably not an overstatement, but a phenomenon. The meteoric rise of myopia in children has reached an unprecedented level that's been considered as a global epidemic by the World Health Organization. Well, at this point, I think and I hope few will question or argue about a dire need of why myopia need to be addressed and managed. Indeed, there's no considerably safe level of what myopia is without any health risk for the eyes. The early myopia occurs in children, the higher the risk of further progression and complications in the later stage of life. So a better question for us to ponder is, how prepared are we to fight against myopia in children? 
Let's travel back in time, just about 700 years ago. Since the invention of the first pair of corrective glasses made in Italy in the 13th century, the way and perception of how we correct myopia has always been the same. That is, the notion of wearing glasses for myopia as a remedy is just as common as we all have cell phones for communication. Then some patients may wonder, if the current mode of correcting vision works well, why bother changing? Sounds pretty logical and reasonable, right? Well, by the same token, if a basic flip phone works well for making a phone calls for families and friends, then why are we switching from flip phone to smartphones? Why has smartphone become the main state in the modern age? Well, the fact is a smartphone itself actually does more than a phone for communication alone at present. It truly represents a global platform for sharing ideas and bridging connections in order to bring better goods for the future. So what does our future hold for our children with myopia? One of the most fascinating interventions used to treat myopia in children is known as orthokeratology, or simply ortho-K. Originally derived from a Greek root, orthokeratology is literally translated into the study of straightening cornea. It is a unique type of rigid contact lens mold that is specifically designed to reshape the front curvature of the eye, known as the cornea. Children are using them during the sleep time, over a period of time, until their eyes reach the level of maturity. This general principle is similar to the well-established notion of having dental braces or Invisalign in order to achieve beautiful smiles. Here's a question. If having a perfectly aligned teeth represent a symbol of confidence to you and your child, then what does having well-reshaped cornea means to you and their lifelong vision? In daily practice, the most amazing and transformative moment for me and for the parents is to see that the kid, when they wake up in the morning, they take off the lens mold, and the already reshaped cornea allows them to maintain clear, unaided vision with more independence from glasses or any other optical correction all day long. More importantly, through the corneal reshaping mechanism, we're also able to fulfill what conventional glasses or contact lenses are yet able to do. That is, to alter the typical path of how other light rays enters the eye at different specific angles. Therefore, redirect the optical signals to the inside rather than the outside of the retina. That has been shown to be able to slow down or even arrest further elongation of the eye in the long run. Parents always wonder, okay, doc, I understand everything you said, but why me and my child after all? Although there's no specific causative factor for myopia, its onset in children is largely associated with family history. That being said, as we look at children's biology and their social upbringings, the conundrum about nature versus nurture is now believed to be related to gene and environmental interaction, or known as a study of epigenetics. This can actually shape the destiny of myopia among children during development, depending on what environmental experiences are being exposed to each individual. Then what about, think about children and adolescents. What are they doing most of the time in school and their spare time? The fact is, their lives and social circle are increasingly consumed by hours and hours of computer work and activities within their labs. Did you actually know that children as young as two years old spend about an average of 42 minutes a day with digital media? That's even before they start learning the alphabets. <laughs> Research have found that increasing amount of screen time, along with a lack of outdoor time, are likely to be the key culprit and also the catalyst for myopia progression. So if we start bringing children with more outdoor experiences for at least an hour or two each day, while they're not yet nearsighted, chances are we may be able to help them delay or even prevent the onset of myopia in the long run. As we all know, the awakening of a change, or any change, has always been daunting and challenging. Change, however, always thrives opportunities. Vision for future, especially for children, certainly merits this opportunity. However, what I notice in clinic every day is that the understanding of myopia, or simply the effort of managing myopia, has somewhat been overlooked or misconceived. 
Myopia is not simply about blurry vision or inconvenience. Myopia is also not about just shrugging shoulders or being complacent with the increasing prescription every year. For every one of us, myopia signifies a global rev revolution of regaining autonomy of children's vision for future. As we have been all so health conscious and savvy about what our children eat in school or at home every single day, I think we should also pay equal attention and devote our best effort in keeping children's vision from this preventable downfall. The growing kid you are seeing today, as shown on the left, will one day become you and I, as shown on the right. The action we have for their vision today will also directly mirror how we want them to be tomorrow. So which version would you aspire your child to be? As a clinician who also happened to be nearsighted, I myself truly experienced the personal impact and also witnessed a lifelong health burden caused by juvenile myopia. This matter has become far too serious to be ignored. What we now know is the mission of treating the root of myopia is no longer as an idealistic, futuristic ideology. Indeed, it is a reality that's really happening at this moment and also can occur in every single child in need. In my opinion, education drives public awareness, and public awareness can nourish doubt and reservation, which ultimately lead to action. In fact, the action that we opt to take for children is not simply about how to redefine myopia itself, but it's also representing a new chapter of how we can help children envision and empower how a functional and clear vision would do for the future. Myopia should not simply be endured. It can be conquered. It is all within our reach. So the first thing you can do is simply go talk about it, talk about myopia, go exercise our social responsibility to challenge this current status quo. Be concerned and also get ready to be uncomfortable for what you already know about myopia. But at the same time, be optimistic as your own advocates to help children stride into a new paradigm of vision. Our next generation will certainly appreciate our effort in giving them the best potential in vision, not just for a day, not just for months, but for life. Thank you.